Well, we've been promising or threatening to do two podcasts a week, and we're not going to let you down. We we have come off the bench to do our second one this week. So uh, welcome to the Titus and Sergio Variety Hour. I'm Sergio Paradise. And without beating around the bush, here he is, the great man, Titus O'Reilly. Well, I think with the events of uh, last night, which we'll get to in a second. Oh, we, we had to come back this morning. There's <laughs> no question. Uh, just before we kick off, um, thanks for everyone. We had a lot of downloads last uh, on Monday, Monday. It was great. So it was good to be back, uh, getting into the swing of it again. Mm-hmm. Uh, just off the top, quick promotion for this gig I'm doing April 8th at Yarraville Laughs, the comedy club there. Uh, I'm interviewing Dane Swan live on stage. It's going to be a, a cracking night, that one. I'll put a link in the uh, show notes to the tickets. There's still tickets available to that. So, still a few. Uh, just went on sale before Christmas, so um, that should be good fun. It will be a great night. Now, before we tackle the curious dilemma, yes. I'm going to hit you between the eyes with something that you haven't heard. Um, well, you do know about it, but after we did our podcast on Monday, on Tuesday, uh, one of our loyal listeners, Natasha, came to me and she said, oh, you know, you blokes were talking about before Christmas how Titus was nominated for the Media Personality of the Year on the Raw.com, oh, yes. and she said, and you guys had a lot of laughs, mainly at his expense, because he was up against <laughs> genuine media Shane personalities. Shane and, and Gerald Waitley. Gerald Waitley and, and some of the female cricket commentators. Yeah. She pointed out to me that on Monday we didn't mention, and this was because you didn't tell me, yes. that you actually won the Media Personality <laughs> of the Year. I did. And not only just won, in a landslide, apparently. Apparently, that's what it said. So, Oh, congratulations. God, but uh, the RSI, my finger from voting, <laughs> <laughs> consistently for myself. God, it was exhausting. So do you get a trophy? Is it, no, is I don't think cash, I get any. It was, it was through the raw.com.au, the yeah. website. So, um, no, I was very thankful everyone voted for me, so... Um, I'm going to give a long Meryl Streep-like speech at some point. <laughs> well, Natasha <laughs> suggested that now on the podcast, whenever you feel like it, you can you can just reminisce about your past triumphs as if you're a Channel 9 cricket commentator. <laughs> <laughs> I, I only really like awards if they come with money. Oh, that's a, the Nobel Prize. I mean, yeah. as I say, I would kill for the Nobel Peace Prize. Because you know? <laughs> he's like eight hundred grand goes. Would you with be it. like Bob Dylan, who just failed to acknowledge it and then didn't show up? Oh, no. yeah, yeah, I would. Because if you're going to get to that point, you've got to be pretty cool. Nobody's as cool as Bob, but <laughs> but to to not acknowledge it and then not turn up, but still bank the eight hundred. I reckon that's that's got that's, oh. that's a good attitude. I like oh yeah. That. When is there is there a noble? Uh, Prize for podcasting? N- not as far as I know. Because <laughs> we wouldn't win that. Uh, now, last night oh, we saw yes. um, one of the great uh, performances in Australian sport, which was Nick Kyrgios. Yes. Uh, last night he lost to uh, the Italian veteran. Yes, yes. So a guy who's like 12 years older than I'm him. glad you used the word veteran because it yes, has to be pretty. 33 or 33. Andreas Seppi. Yeah, yep. so he's a lot older than Kyrgios. And Kyrgios was up two two sets to love. Did the first two in a canter. He, that first one he won, like, what, 6-1? Yeah, in, in about 19 minutes. The second one was a bit closer. But he still had his measure. He, yeah. did, he didn't look overextended. No, and he was too up. He just, and then he just basically in front of the entire country, yeah. if you didn't see it, have a mental breakdown. He just, even, but even halfway, two-thirds of the way through the third set, he still... He was in, they were all just going on serve. He wasn't getting beaten. He just looked like, and Jim Courier said this, he said, I, I don't know what's happened. He, he, he looks like he's he just hating being out there. Yeah. Whereas all he has to do is pretty much serve it out and he's got the match. Yeah, he looked, he looked like someone, it was, like a, it was exactly like watching a petulant teenager that has oh. been made to go to a party he doesn't want to go to or oh. something, a well, family well, event. Well, speaking of family, last night my entire family, my wife and two boys, were at the tennis and really? managed to weasel their way down to front row seats at High Sense. How come you weren't there? Oh, oh I suppose I should tell you, I, I, I got banned from Melbourne Park <laughs> la- last year. Sort of a little misunderstanding involving one of those giant tennis balls. <laughs> 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 but, but they were there and they said being down that close, 
you get to hear what the players say. Yeah. Um, everything that's oh, not picked up. Oh, I hope your up, children didn't get to hear yeah, what they oh, oh, That's all right. They've heard the odd audible obscenity <laughs> already at the, home. There's plenty of code violations yeah, at your house. Oh, don't worry about that. But uh, they said when he first started losing the plot a bit, yeah. he was standing there, and while Seppi's lining up to serve, he kept saying to himself under his breath, these shorts are too tight. My shorts are too tight. And really? he was looking up at his, his players' box and his support group, my shorts are too tight. And my, my wife said, he's a loony. He's feeding him losing the plot. Because <laughs> A, his shorts didn't appear. I mean, they don't wear tight shorts anymore. No. And, and he was just completely losing the plot and his eyes were rolling back in his head and he was swearing and carrying on. And- he did keep talking. He said something to the player, his players' box, like, well, this was, that was your idea after something went wrong. Yeah, I, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's the oldest tennis player's trick in the book. You, it was just you hit the ball point. 10 feet long and you glare up at your players' box like, he, they, like they hit it. He still had chances to win the match, oh. several chances. He, he pulled it together for five minutes. Like, even with him basically not wanting to be there and playing with a body language that was just, oh, the, you know, he wasn't moving and he still almost won. So that shows you exactly. That's the thing about Kyrgios. His talent matches his, you know, yeah. terrible behaviour. Yeah. The two kind of, but he just, he gives up. He's the opposite of like, and McEnroe criticised him last night, and he's the opposite yeah. of McEnroe where McEnroe had terrible behaviour, but it was driven by a ferocious will to win. Brutal competitive urge, when yeah. When Kyrgios is like, you know, he's he's just this, he is a petulant teenager. Oh. I mean, he's not a teenager, but that's, that's completely how he comes across. He's someone that has never matured no. beyond, you know, 14. No. He's just stuck there. And then the bit where in the sixth set, he actually uh, hit the ball between his legs yeah. in the middle of a normal game. Like, he just And he, he just won the lost. point, which he shouldn't have. He but, just threw his. He just oh, spat the dummy. There's no other way to describe it. He's just impossible to to put a handle on. I mean, I I actually had this theory last night, which and I have absolutely no qualifications whatsoever to come sure. up with it. But I tend to think deep down, he might be scared of achieving, or, or scared of winning, or he, he doesn't maybe want to be. So he's self-destructing. Yeah, he's self-destructing sort of deliberately rather than have to face the reality of being an elite top two player. I mean, as I say, I have no qualifications for that. I can understand that. I wanted to lose that Raw award (laughs) for similar reasons. Yeah, but you only got it because of your brutal competitive urge, like little Leighton O'Reilly. The thing I find is this swagger he's got that some people say is, you know, great, it... It's not a cool swagger. It's a no. swagger of someone who's trying so hard to, I think to your point, just show he doesn't care about anything. And you know those people, they do care because they're yeah. just so over the top trying to impress upon us that they don't care. He, he, he's, he's a tennis player. Yeah. He acts like he's in, you know, he's like, he's, he acts like he's in from, you know, NWA. Yeah, you know, exactly. He acts like he's this hardcore, yeah, grew up in punk. the get. Yeah, yeah. and he's... <laughs> He's yeah, playing tennis. That's my point. His, his, his swagger is like the strut of a kid in a street gang who's yeah. not the leader of the gang, but they let him tag along and yeah. he struts and, and goes a bit harder, and even though he's got nothing going for him. The amazing bit afterwards is, well, uh, during the commentary one things I like, they had Leighton Hewitt commentating. Yes. And before his meltdown, they asked Leighton a bunch of things about, you know, Nick and coaching him in Davis Cup mm. and being involved in all that. And, and, and Leighton was on great behaviour and saying all wonderful things about him. Yeah. And he even at one point said, oh, look, he's got a great reputation in the, uh, in the locker in the, room. The players love him, you know. They're all just coming going, out and saying that. And then it was always on, and on cue, you know, Kyrgios just started to have this major meltdown. Oh, I loved it when they crossed it to the, as they call it, the commentary bunker. Yes. Now, it's not the comm box, it's the commentary bunker. And I thought, gee, pick the odd man out here. Leighton Hewitt. Jim Courier, Basil Sampoulis. <laughs> well, yeah, that's right. And Jim of course, Courier. it's Jim Courier because he's American. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the, afterwards, in the me- media conference, which was another sullen oh. performance, that was. Uh, but did you see the smirk on his face when he walked in? The whole oh. thing, was, but the whole, all of that is just it was so a, contrived it's and a, annoying. It, it, but all that is just someone who's so out of their depth. Yeah. And they walk in, and they—it's like when 
you know, I keep saying it, but it's like when a, a kid smirks. Yeah. They know, but they know they've actually stuffed up. Yeah. But they just can't be, they don't have the maturity to go. Somebody should just say to Kiros, wipe that stupid look right off your face <laughs> or I'll wipe it off for you. you know? That's right. <laughs> so uh, he came in and he did a whole, like, song and dance about, you know, someone said, pointed out McEnroe had criticised him and he kind of went, oh, good for him and, yeah. you know, it's all that. And then he said... Um, he thinks he needs to take the off season, the preseason, more seriously. Yeah, fair you know, point. Yeah, and that he should play less basketball. Possibly, yeah, being a tennis player and, and yeah, all that. That's you know. right. Like, <laughs> training yeah. for the wrong sport. Yeah, yeah. I, when I'm taking up equestrian, you know, I'm going to cut back on my golf. <laughs> <you know? laughs> so he said that might be uh, might be something he'll think about. And then he also said he's thinking about. Getting a, uh, a, coach. a coach. Yes. So a coach might be someone to get. On top of that, another one asks, are you still seeing a sports psychologist? Which, which if, correct me if I'm wrong, that was one of the things he had to do as part of his punishment for tanking. Yeah, that's right. Um, back before Christmas. And he said that, um, yeah, he is still seeing them and it's going right. really well. And I thought, is it? I thought, this must <laughs> be... Uh, the same sports psychologist that helped Travis Cloak with his goal kicking. <laughs> Remind me of the shrink in The Sopranos, sitting there listening to Tony Soprano every week. You know? <laughs> That's right, and getting nowhere. And then you, you listen to him and you're saying the right things, but you know he's just going to walk out that door and <laughs> whack somebody. You know? That's right. <laughs> so anyway, Kyrgios, well done. Uh, made us all proud uh, uh, with your professionalism at the end of that. And just an amazing night of sport. Well, we'll see, right after the match, I started, flicked it over to watch Bernard Tomic. Now, he won the first two sets, lost the third, and I thought, he looks like he's about to melt down here as well. What a story that would be yeah, if, if that both. happened. But he did, he got out of jail in the fourth. He, he looked, I watched that after yeah. as well, and compared to Kyrgios, he looked like the ultimate professional. He did. I mean, Kyrgios is now making Tomic look... Yeah. Like mature, mature. Yeah. Like you know, he's just you, you know, I, you kind of. I've almost got a warm feeling towards Bernie now because it's just in comparison, you know. If Bernie's smart, and I'm not convinced that he is, <laughs> he could take this down and and change his entire the um, narrative around him. Like the exactly. more he, the better he becomes now he, by comparison. It makes him look amazing. He, he will be able to reverse all his bad publicity over the years. Instantly, if he if he yeah. plays this smartly, the the thing here too is the worst thing about Kyrgios, and we bag him a lot, and mm. he totally deserves it. Like people say, oh, everyone's getting on him. Like he is the author of his problems. Like, oh, correct. He is the one that has behaved appallingly yep. for so long, and the crowd were all massively behind him last night. Oh. which I don't know why you would have after that. I mean, well, apparently the, the, the- you, you keep giving him the opportunity yeah. to prove you're wrong, and he just doesn't. Well, what I heard last night was that. The, the the crowd, it was just electrifying. It was like being at an NBA game. Yeah. And they were all for Which Kyrgios. Which is where Kyrgios would have preferred to Which, have been. Yeah, he would have been rather watching the Knicks. <laughs> so, but the thing about Kyrgios is his talent is undeniable. Yeah, no That's question. That's the thing that frustrates everyone so much mm. is he absolutely has all the talent in the world, but he just doesn't have the commitment or the... But you ask any coach of any sport, not just tennis, footy, Team games, the the list of players who have enormous talent, but not the the mental side. Yeah, uh, it, it, the list is legion. Yeah, you, you talk to footy coaches, they go, "Oh, I, I could name twenty kids yeah. who had more talent when they came to preseason than I don't know, buddy Chris Judd." But they just didn't want to make it. They just didn't have what it took to get there. See, I know they had the physical or the mental. Yeah. People used to say it was a rare, a rare combination. <laughs> that, that combination is actually more common than no, you, they said it was more incredibly, common than you think. <laughs> they said they'd never seen anyone who's so poor on both levels at once. I was, in, I was a dual threat to myself. <laughs> you were poor on both sides of your body. Yeah. <laughs> a danger to myself and others. Now, uh, one of the big stories we had in our last podcast, oh, um, yes. which has continued on, uh, Lovergate, as I've starting to call it, which was uh, the jockey who uh, steered his horse into two favourites to block them uh, so his girlfriend could win on the lead. His Norwegian girlfriend could win. His Norwegian girlfriend, to give the proper title, could win the race, which she then went on to do. Now, it says that um, his Norwegian girlfriend, Anna Georgiou, 
21 is not in a great place after Josh Cartwright's unprecedented move on South Australia's Morfittville track. Yeah. Are you a big fan of Morfittville as yep. a track? Oh, yeah, it, it goes the wrong way. I, mean, <laughs> I, I, I think it goes anti-clockwise. I prefer Does it clockwise. I don't know. I've just made that I up. I don't think that's true at all from watching the actual race. I think this is like you in harness racing. It's, <laughs> it's just, you just kind of have the confidence to make up the <laughs> answer as, we go along. as you go along. And I think that's none of that of what you've just said is no. true. Uh, now, he's going. To, he's facing a, a lengthy ban. Um, he helped her win the race. Now, he's been stood down after admitting he rode recklessly and he faces yeah. a steward's inquiry. Uh, it's, it says this week, so we've only got a couple of days left this week, so it should be soon. Uh, the, uh, his Norwegian girlfriend's trainer said that uh, the apprentice was, uh, she's an apprentice, was upset, and uh, he can, and she firmly believes she can win the race without her talented boyfriend. This is what's written in the paper, right. talented boyfriend to help. Now, is her boyfriend, what, is, if he's a talented, what's he talented at? Well, Taking out other horses. Well, he, he is, Jan, I know he is regarded as, as a good young up and coming jockey. I mean, this right. is not doing himself any favours. No. Here. But, but you know, the, the Norwegian girlfriend, she's. I said he's going to lose the Norwegian oh, girlfriend. Yeah, it's, it's the, the classic, you know, I don't need your help here. I'm, yeah. I'm fine on my own. Thanks. I was, okay. I, I was eight lengths in front, See, Josh. You got, you know, you needed, you know, it's hard being a, a bloke, you, you know, when to help and when, when to, to not. It's so hard. To, but I've now filed this away. Like if I'm ever in a horse race, <laughs> I will not take out two other horses just to win the affections yeah. of a lady. Yeah. I, you I know, think, I, I, used to, I used to think that was the weight or a woman's heart. Well, so did I, but I think both of us would struggle to ride at 48 kilos just quietly. <laughs> but. Uh, now, uh, they've. I've read about this. It sounds like. He, uh, Josh Cartwright, is not going through a good time mentally and a bunch of other things they yeah. seem to point to, which is what happens now every time some, a sportsman does something stupid. You yeah. instantly now get the... Mental health. Mental thing. health. And, and now, I'm not saying that there isn't a significant part of mental health and it's a serious mm -hmm. issue, but it feels like it seems to be the now the go-to thing to say yeah. to the point where it actually cheapens when... There are the ones, and I don't know if this is the case with him. No. And that's Look, the problem is we don't ever know, but it seems to be let to as a bit of a defence these days. I could not agree more. I, I regard this new mental health issues, quote, unquote, excuse that it's like the 21st century equivalent of a note from your mum. But, but the know? thing is it's not always an excuse. This is what makes it so difficult because yeah. there are legitimate cases of mental of health and mental health is a serious issue and should be taken Seriously, yeah. so so the minute it's but it's is like you say it's being becoming produced trivialized as a, it's becoming by, as a get out of like get out of jail yeah. free card is if it's a way of saying well whatever my actions were are fine because it's a mental health thing. If it now, explains stupid or irresponsible behaviour, yeah, and that's not or, necessarily or a the case. Yeah, so yeah. It's a, and it's a tough one when we're commentating on things because you yeah. sort of go well, what if it is and. Oh, yeah, we don't, just don't know. But, but they said, oh, it's out of character. Yet we know he once mid-race tried to steal the uh, riding stock, oh, the, the whip, whip, the whip of, of another a, jockey. Of a fellow jockey. So it's not out of character completely. And, and look, it, uh, he's obviously going to cop a fair whack from the stewards over this. Just slightly. Although, I've got to say, when, when you combine this with the previous whip incident, I've become a, a big Josh Cartwright fan, <laughs> yeah, even though those two horses have taken out an AVO on him, but <laughs> the ones he ran into. But other than that, I, I, look, I, I, I just adding a hope, bit of a WWE excitement to horse oh, racing, which exactly. is much needed. Oh, look, I, I just hope he patches things up with Norwegian. No, Dawn I would Anna. be upset if he lost. You never want someone to lose their Norwegian girlfriend, no, especially not to another jockey. I don't that's just that on any. That's just rubbing it in <laughs> now. Yeah. It did remind one of our uh, listeners, a uh, senior Hias. Not senior. Sure, not sure. Yeah. Senior Hias. Not sure if that's his real name. Oh. Uh, but he sent and contacted me and said it reminded him this of um, our point that, uh, and I think this was after we found out a bunch of stuff about jockeys doing uh, various oh, was this when the, race fixing and various yeah, things, I think. Or was it when they got really pissed at Warrnambool? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And we mentioned that, I mentioned at the time, that one of the things when we discussed mm. is one of the things that they should really investigate yeah. is having monkeys as jockeys. Yes. 
far cheaper. Yeah. Work for more peanuts. reliable. They <laughs> more don't. Reliable. They don't get Norwegian girlfriends. No, no, no. They don't ever. <laughs> anyway, monkey he, jockeys. Is, he oh, he sent idea. me a thing reminding uh, he found online, um, and I looked into this, and I've I've got a bit from the article here, which I think uh, you're going to like, yeah. which is about. Um, the fact that there was back in the 1930s quite commonly monkey jockeys yeah. riding uh, greyhound greyhounds monkeys on greyhounds yeah. oh, now you're talking uh, and so I read a bit this article and this article is terrific now apparently it happened around the world a bit it happened in Australia even and but it yeah. happened a lot in the US and there was actually the brainchild of one couple uh, yeah. Loretta and Charles David and they had. Um, this venture, which was a huge success of racing these, and basically it was so popular back in the 30s that every single racetrack in America right. was happy to have them, was the, the mon- wanted them to come and race. Monkeys riding greyhounds. Yeah, because it was so popular with the crowd that oh, it was. Hilarious. So what they learned, they, a couple of things they learned is one, um, it took them, they said that if they'd known all of them how much work and time and training that would be involved in getting it to happen, they might never have done it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what they found was that the secret to actually, and this is, I think this is important if you mm. ever want to, you know, because I, I think this needs to come back. Oh, I'd love to see this. I mean, there'll be yeah. a lot of types out there that will point out that this is like, Against everything around oh, animal sure, sure, you know, humane treatment. Not, yeah. But could, couldn't you imagine but that sometimes you have to trade before off before the grand final? You know? Yeah, that's right. Sometimes you have to trade off inhumane things yeah. for for comedy gold. Yes. For for human entertainment. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So you know, so here so they said the secret, Surgeon, you and I need to know this if we're gonna start this, is the secret if you want to race if you want to have monkey jockeys, yes, they said, is you have to raise the monkeys and the greyhounds together from birth, right, so that the animals overcome their natural animosity towards <laughs> each other. <laughs> so that's point one. Okay, but I thought greyhounds were supposed to be so gentle. No, but no, not with, not with, not with no, I think it's what the monkeys. monkeys are quite aggressive too. So they one they needed to do that. Um, they also said that one of the interesting things traveling in America that they learned, and you wonder what they learned, but. The monkeys hate the cold, so right. they had to do the. They did the northern states in their summer, and then yeah. when it got to winter, they went down to down Florida to and yeah. stuff to do it because otherwise the monkeys. And they said they had to always have uh, lots of bananas in their trailer, like <laughs> constantly. But it said that one of the things, and this is about whether it works. It said the monkeys proved so competitive that they would sometimes get carried away and try to prevent a rival from winning by either jumping onto his back. Or tearing the clothes off him as he passed. Right. They also used their tails as whips to try to make the greyhounds run faster. Oh, look! Everything about that just says bring back monkey jockeys. It to just me. does. I mean, uh, but, but they used to wear their own like little silks. Yeah. How tiny would monkey silks oh, be? Oh, be ter- and, Jockey silks themselves are small. And I enough. love the will to win. Yes. They were that competitive. They were that competitive. You know, they could teach Nick Curry or something. <laughs> and, and, and I think again. The chief steward was Galen from Planet of the Apes. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently it was popular in the United States, but there are also monkey races were known to exist in both Australia and Mexico. There, look, I know there is one very grainy photo existing, I think, taken at the former Olympic Park in Melbourne, right. which is where Collingwood is now, yeah. the Holden Centre, um, of one of these. And you, you can actually see a monkey on board a greyhound. And, and uh, it was moving pretty well, too, I've got to well, say. Well, the greyhound industry needs something to it really re, re, uh, sort of market, rebrand yeah. themselves. Yeah. Because um, they've tr- been accused of a lot of animal cruelty. So I think going to monkey jockeys is mm. the way to really address that. But just don't train them using live monkeys. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, now, in another uh, story we've had is uh, Brisbane Broncos centre James Roberts. It's now- a fairly easy segue from monkeys to this. <laughs> Uh, he's found himself in strife yet again after it emerged. He pulled the hair of a young woman in the Gold Coast nightclub following the Magic Millions horse racing carnival. Yeah. Now, the thing that's interesting about this is Broncos has... Uh, 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 Roberts. Robert, since moving to the Broncos, before he moved to the Broncos, he was fined two, uh, 20 grand last season, um, an incident at the Normanby Hotel in Brisbane, yeah. where he refused to leave the venue and asked before... Uh, uh, before us and uh, abused a female staff member. Yes. Uh, 
Apparently, then he took off to a Thailand rehabilitation centre. Oh, as they all do. Which we always talk about. The rehabilitation, they're always in Thailand. They're always in Thailand. So Pl- that's where they sent Plenty him. Plenty of monkeys over there. Now, he's been sacked from two previous clubs. Yeah, he's got form. Penrith and South Sydney for poor behaviour. Um, and this could end mean the end of his career. Now, what I find interesting about this is there's a lot of accusations of well, he was meant to be being managed. Yeah. So apparently uh, with the Normandy Hotel one last year, yeah. apparently what he did is they said that the, the Broncos had actually given him full-time pretty much a welfare officer. A minder. Just basically, yeah, they called yeah. it a welfare officer, but it was basically someone to hang out with him yeah. and make sure he didn't get himself into trouble. Into fights or make sure he gets home. Apparently this job was the nightmare job. Oh, <laughs> Because no matter what, even with a full-time minder, he still got up to a lot of stuff, but then he found ways to just slip the minder whenever. <laughs> so at the night of the Normandy one where he, um, he apparently said to the welfare officer, time to might call it a night, yeah. eh? And the welfare officer goes, yeah, yeah thinking, good thank- idea. thankfully I got through the night. Yeah. So <laughs> at least basically said, will you take the first cab? Oh, has he done that one? <laughs> that old one? Oh, and then, I, they and- hail a cab. Oh, oh hey, uh, Tomo, you ta- I'll, I'll get, get the get next the, yeah, one. Yeah, and then- Oldest trick in the book. <laughs> and then gone back in. Oh. <laughs> so oh. the welfare officers in the cab home thinking, oh, hey, that didn't job work. done. Didn't work for Shannon Noll the other night. That, that, <laughs> I'll go back in. So that's a that's a our NRL getting off to a good start to the year. Yeah, they, they never let us down the NRL for stupid. They're behavior. having enormous issues at the moment. They're they're um they're all their clubs are up in outcry over. They've got you know they've only had this independent commission like the AFL has for like oh, a couple yeah. of years now, and already uh, their chair is facing being sacked by the clubs. Oh, and, they hate him. They want to get they rid hate of him. him. And then one of the things they want to do is uh, put. Club representatives back on the commission. Yeah, because that'll work. Because it, you know, it worked so well before. Yeah. Meanwhile, the AFL is just this ruthless beast. Yes, that's so centrally controlled. Yeah, what what you've got is yeah the the AFL are like a, a totalitarian regime. Yeah, like like a China that that that, that brooks no um, opposition, opposition or, yeah. or, or anything. Even the most powerful clubs can't stop the AFL commission. Steamrolls and what they say goes, and we've seen that m- numerous times over the last couple of years. NRL, though, stumble from sort of banana republic to l- dumb democracy and, and back and forth, Yeah, but they can never quite get it right. No. Because they're still stuck up there in the what used to be understandable the self-interest of the individual clubs. Everybody involved comes from a club mm. and they all want the best for them. And that's, that's where they're struggling, whereas the AFL clubs all know now that, yeah, you can, you can, you can be all for your own club, but you are going to have to toe the party line. It's as simple as that. Yeah. No, it's, but there's no party line in the NRL. It's a mess. Uh, Andy Murray uh, last night was playing the Australian Open and seemed to have injured his ankle. He still won. So he literally won <laughs> I saw on him one go foot. Over. Yeah, it was... Uh, and, and and they didn't do close-ups on it. And I've got to say, not that impressed with his black Under Armour runners either. Well, it looked like he just, the reason his ankle, he looked like he hadn't tied his shoelaces up yeah, tight enough. dodgy-looking runners. Got to say, while we're talking tennis fashion, it's only three <laughs> days in, but I'm already very much over the fluorescent orange. Yeah, now, yeah. Now, well, Kyrgios is gone, so we don't have to worry about him anymore, but the fluorescent orange, the shirts, the, the socks, over it. <laughs> Over it. Our fa- you're our fashion correspondent yeah, on the guru, variety the hour. Guru, yeah. Now Andy I'm Murray on the Alex Perry of the podcast. <laughs> yeah. Now Andy Murray's mum, Judy Murray. Um, Judy has- Murray, didn't she sing Snowbird? <laughs> What's a reference before my time? Oh no, yeah, that was Anne Murray. Anne Murray. <laughs> right. uh, she's come out and said the secret to uh, Andy's recent run of great form right. is fatherhood. She says it's been a blessing for the world, number one, Uh, not in becoming a sir, actual fatherhood. Uh, And she says that it's not only given him perspective away from the court, but it's actually helped him on the court. Uh, And she's pointed out that he's had career-high nine tournaments uh, in 2016, including Wimbledon and gold at the Rio Olympics. Mm. Uh, Now, is this a solution perhaps for (laughs) Kyrgios? Do you think this should be, if oh. you were coaching Kyrgios, is this, 
you know, and for Tom H too, we should actually say maybe yeah, time to have a kid. Go down the, the Andy Murray path. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Maybe you better, you better father a kid. Actually, this could apply to a lot of uh, our sportsmen and women. Maybe Josh Cartwright and the Norwegian girlfriend that might sort him out. <laughs> we there. Sort that out. We could fix it all. We could fix the, uh, the monkeys. Yeah, we could fix that. We could fix James Roberts. James the Roberts. Brisbane he Broncos. needs the responsibility of parenthood. So I think having a kid is. Uh, I've long said this. Having a kid solves so many problems. Oh, of course it does. You know, marriage. If your if your marriage is yeah. suffering, have a kid. Oh, let me, yeah. <laughs> you let know me, this. Oh, let me tell you, it solves every problem, especially, <laughs> especially school fees. You know, stuff like that. No, that, that solves everything. <laughs> but Mrs. Murray, Andy's mum. Yeah. Does oh, do you reckon she just has a bit too much to say? Well, she did this. Where I got this from was a full interview she'd done. Yeah, she's. You know, it's she's made like, herself as big a celebrity as her son. I mean, I'm a bit wary of that. Famous sporting mums. You think there's Shay Warne's mum? Yes. Who he bought in and blamed for giving him the the, the diuretic, the diet, the diet tablet. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, but that one. And then I always like my favourite sports mum yeah. was Chris Judd's mum writing that song. Oh. Do you remember that? She wrote a song about oh. Chris Judd. We've got to we've got to hunt that out. For and next it was week. just appalling, and it was the sort of thing I where you felt just... really, you know, Chris Judd's big and ugly enough and rich enough to look after himself, <laughs> but I really felt sorry for him that oh. way. Can you imagine? Uh, so Andy Murray's mum, yeah, she does like an interview. Yeah. Doesn't she, mind uh, giving her thoughts. Oh, she loves the publicity. And, but oh, oh, Andy seems to cop it, doesn't worry about it. I mean, well, it's not like his, his wife as well has been in the media a lot. So it seems like the women in yeah. his world like don't mind a bit of... And he's, he's happy to be, to be, you know, what's worked for him. As, as Mrs. Murray says, he, he just won Wimbledon, won an Olympic gold. Yeah, well, that's all fatherhood, Serge. Yeah, it yeah. solves every problem. Yeah. Uh, now, there's been a massive uh, Olympic fight happening over Christmas, which oh, uh, has got a little has. bit of media. Um, this so is you, Australian Olympics we're talking well, about. Well, you've got to remember, yeah, that's right. After the Rio Olympics in which the uh, Australian team... Uh, Por- worst abys- performance w- ever. Abysmal performance. Worst Where- since... Uh, I think it's the worst in sort of uh, since 1992. Yeah. In, and in, in actual medals. But then, you know, I go back to considering how far we've come up. This is as bad as the uh, Montreal games were yeah, back in the 70s. 76. 76. Yeah, so it's, yeah. It was a right, disaster. I mean, we won one goal. It was a disaster. Um, now, a big part of this came out of the uh, funding model the winning edge funding model that the Australian Sports Commission yep. under Chairman John Wiley had bought in. Yeah. Uh, which had. Uh, completely sort of uh, changed the way sports are funded and it's caused a lot of angst around that didn't work. So j- just explain to me a bit how this changed, that he, he was pointing, pushing the money towards what, not the sports that necessarily needed more money, but the ones that were giving us the best potential for Olympic that success? Was, yeah, yeah, part of it. There's been a couple of ones. There was the Crawford report, yeah. which came out and said that Australian sport generally, they shouldn't just funnel all the money towards winning gold medals. Yeah. That shouldn't be the what we actually take. It should actually go to participation. And oh, so, so that's sports not, like NRL yeah. and AFL and stuff and, and um, A-League and stuff, they should get more money so that, because so they're that, popular. That attitude's not going to go well no. with Olympic officials because no, it, it could do, cut in on their junkets. No, that's right. And, they, and, they, and also, their payoffs. The only thing that matters being Australian is sporting success. So where they say we need to spread the money more equally over uh, non-Olympic sports and Olympic sports. Mm. We, so we've got to expect less medals. I'm mm. like, no, we need more money into sports. All up, all, We're spending all too much on health, <laughs> too much on education. We're giving money to the arts. It's nuts. Uh, Defence. <laughs> Defence. Yeah. Do we need, I mean, who's going to attack us? If, like, we're not going to. How, how many gold medals? could be bought with what we're spending on these submarines oh. or the F-35 fighter jets. That's right. Like, this idea of accepting not being not winning gold medals is anathema to Australian culture. Everything, everything. That's These people made should this be country deported, great. Serge. They should be what? Deported. Whew, that's good. Yeah. Well, let's okay. get some people in that want to win gold medals. They're yeah. all in the camp in Nauru. <laughs> let's get let's get Laurie Lawrence up there. <laughs> <laughs> It's, get Lauren, let's teach those Sudanese kids to swim. A swim over. Yeah. You know, that's how we'll start testing people. But anyway, uh, so John Wiley is the chair. He's come out and they're, he, they're having a... Who's a, he fighting with? He's fighting John Coates, who's the uh, head of the Australian Olympic Committee. I'm and has you, been since 1990. You, ha- you have not worked in sport if yeah, you haven't had a blue with John Coates. That's right. Anyway, they're, they're now um, they can't agree 
whether there is a top five target for the Australian team at the Olympic Games. These two are fighting. And they're fighting over correspondence. So these letters are all becoming public. They're just firing letters at each other. Fantastic. Which I do love. It's sort of how business people fight, just through correspondence. (laughs) So uh, anyway, so Wiley said, you know, that, you know, that he wants to reset the working relationship because they are not friendly. The, the uh, way has been that, you know, the Olympics gets too much money and that yeah. the focus on winning gold medals is not right. So he, that's going to get them not exactly happy. So he's written John Wiley to Coates saying, let's reset our working relationship. Like, we've well, obviously, We're obviously you know, not everyone's getting on. heated, let's, let's calm down, yeah. let's try and work out where we've got points of similarity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All, all great stuff to say. So that work? You can imagine Coates, though, always, uh, he's come back and said, uh, that he's this has set him off because in it he's talked about how basically uh, that he suggested, although you can read it several ways, but one way in it is said that what Wiley's suggesting is to take over the independence of the Australian Olympic Committee. And oh. the Australian Olympic Committee has fought back to where before Montreal yeah. and after Montreal Olympics, which were a disaster, has fought to be completely independent from government as a whole. So they've really been yeah. against it. So he's while, come back. While taking as much money as they can. Well, yes and no. They've actually sold a lot of their money. They've made a lot of money selling Sydney marketing rights when Sydney 2000 was held right. to try and get away from being solely government, government funded, funded as an organisation. Yeah. But they still, the individual sports and stuff still get a lot of money. So he fires back a letter to Wiley, sort of ripping him to shreds, and he CCs him, which is the best passive-aggressive way to do anything in a yeah. work environment, Malcolm Temple, Big Bill Shorten, and acting sports minister Arthur Sinodinus. Oh, so he's, oh, and, then, and oh, then it Arthur, seems to have Arthur also gone to the this. media. Yeah. So he's like... <laughs> so old Coatsy's come out swinging here. Yeah, his Coatsy's just... He's not Every, exactly... Everybody has a, a John Coates story, and it's, it's generally not that that, you know... Not favourable, yeah. but uh, you've got to admire his pugilistic skills. He, he will come out swinging at the slightest thing, John Well, he, he, he responded to, <laughs> he, uh, over Christmas with a detailed 15-page letter. Right. So that's a fair and bit. And that's been made public as well. So, that's yeah. the one he sees oh, everyone yeah. in. Uh, he interpreted Wiley said no, to him um, a clo- that he's plead for a closer and renewed partnership between our organisation. So that's what Wiley's written. Coates has taken that as an attempt to take them over. Oh, yeah. I don't really think that is. Reading that, a closer and renewed partnership between our organisations mm. doesn't exactly. I mean, it's now, not a takeover bit, the, is it? It doesn't sound like one. Now, maybe stuff's been said off the record mm. outside of correspondence that set him up, but it does seem. Uh, thing. Now, one thing is. Wiley has also wanted a reasonable and appropriate. Uh, he, he thinks it's a reasonable, appropriate that the selection process for the summer and winter games, Chef de Michon, be handled as a partnership between us in open process involving consideration of a range of candidates. So Wiley's basically saying the Australian Sports Commission, which is basically what distributes money from the yeah. federal government to the various sports, um, want to say in picking Chef de Michons in the future. Your, your new Kitty Chiller. Which I think has got to be a reaction to Kitty Chiller. Has to be. Has to be. You know, who, so, who, who has not been Kitty's happy. Kitty's rubbed a few noses the wrong I way. I think she has. At, at the, the ASC. Yeah. So um, now the a- he's pointed out again, John Wiley at the AOC, point out that they invest $350 million over the past four years to the Olympics team. Yeah. So he's not without some... Power and ability here. <laughs> like $350 million is okay. Is it enough? I say no, given oh, results. Wouldn't buy half a submarine. I think we should be putting in maybe towards sports in Australia, investing in the Olympic team and sports generally. Yeah. So to get past this, it's either all, which is it's either you invest in all sports, including yes. on in, or you focus on gold medals. You should be doing both. I, I think, you know, maybe half of tax revenue should go to sports. <laughs> well, c- certainly. As you say, health, education should be slashed. And I, I Do we would, need secondary education? And I would schools? say all foreign aid. Oh, g- don't I get mean, me started. Don't, don't, well, let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I've heard him on, on a all go anti-foreign to sport. aid rant. You don't want to hear it. You don't want to be around Well, it just all should go to sport. It should. It should. You know, um, so that was, you know, on roads, why are we bothering keeping these roads? Infrastructure generally. 
We're just spending more, and more money for it. Doesn't fix the anything. only infrastructure that should be built are more sports grounds That's right. and better facilities. I think the Southern Stand, the MCG, is due for an upgrade. Yeah. And every SEG needs a bit of an upgrade too. Every local footy team needs a big screen, yeah. a jumbotron. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so anyway, that looks like a fun fight that's going to continue on, and it oh. makes you feel that uh, our Olympic bids over the it next few years are not going to go well. Just two egomaniac blokes, and it's always blokes, you know, like oh, this. blokes are the worst. Um, doing the who's got the bigger one? It it is a real there is, is a real argument at the top levels of sport at the moment about how money is distributed, and this oh, is all no, about but this the money. Is just who's got the biggest. <laughs> and I should just bring Anthony Rocker in and solve that problem immediately. <laughs> now, I'll tell you, um, well, yeah, the tri- I, I think Brendan Favola should be come brought in to manage the money. He's got a proven track record. Eddie Betts, uh, talking to people who've got the money, he's extended his contract uh, with the Adelaide Crows. So, man, up, you're out. He's, he's decided to spend the... Just to uh, rub it into the Carlton supporters yeah, even Yeah, want to do that. And um, just also to, uh, ext- you know... You would appreciate someone wanting to spend another three years in Adelaide. Well, after bagging them so mercilessly. Well, on that kind of day, you somebody tell me about how you have now bagged on this podcast. Yeah. Perth. Yeah. Uh, Adelaide. Adelaide oh, oh. a lot. Yeah. Nary Warren. Oh, that was just on Monday. I was. It wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> not, it wasn't there. a brutal sledge on Nary Warren. Uh, I think you called them basically everyone that lives there a criminal. Uh, yeah, I did possibly <laughs> su- su- suggest that there was a. A higher degree of criminality. <laughs> what, have you done any overseas ones yet? Cleveland, I go the way. Cleveland, you go the way. That's an ordinary joint. I think. <laughs> <laughs> so Eddie's uh, got that. That has uh, been a, a nice little. It's worked out well for Eddie uh, going to. And did you hear what he said? He, but they came to him and said, uh, "How much longer do you reckon you got?" And he said, "Oh, three years." And they go, "Okay, here's a three-year deal." Yeah, easiest contract of all time, and on plenty of dough too. Yeah. So good luck to him. He he is. And did you see that bloke that um, Burn Atomic was playing last night? Yeah. Absolute dead ringer for Eddie Betts. He really? Was. Yeah. Well, what's his name? That um, Estrella Borges. He thought he looked like Eddie Betts. Absolute dead ringer. Great. Not as good in the pocket, though. No, no. He was not good from the, the tight angles. Oh, Eddie Betts is just one of those players that at Carlton was sort of an, a good player, but seen as only okay. The move to Adelaide has not only been great for his footy, yeah. but he's become beloved. Oh. Like, you can't not like he, the guy. He, he's the most popular player in the AFL. And you know, and you know what? And this is it's, it's a touch of the Andy Murrays here. He moved to Adelaide. I think he's got three kids he's all had in Adelaide. And uh, he, he puts that down to a, a See, lot of his success. Have a kid, Serge. Have kids. Curios. <laughs> now. Have a listen to us, Nick. This was a huge story yeah. this week. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Gary Ablett. Yeah. He sold his house. Well, he's put it up for sale. Put it up for sale in the Gold Coast. And the media reacted like, whoa. Oh, he's out he's of there. He's back to Geelong. He's out of there. Now, he tried his to mansion, leave mansion, they call it. His Gold Coast mansion. Well, I'll tell you what. It is a mansion because yeah, it's, it's a 3,342 3, square metre residence. Yeah. That is big. That's a big house. That, that, that's not your little, you know, terrace. That's a house that you get lost in. And it's, and it's, I could not live in a house that big. I'll tell you why. I think I could. <laughs> <laughs> I just forget there were whole bits of the house. And, uh, oh, the, the West Wing, the East <laughs> yeah, Wing. Yeah, I haven't been in this room for several years. But it's a fair looking joint. I mean, it's got his own. Um, it's on the river. Uh, his, his own jetty. Yeah. For, for his boat. I don't know whether Gaz has got a boat, but you know, <laughs> he might just throw that in. Now, uh, it comes after last year he tried to get out of the Suns. Yeah. He asked to leave. He yeah. said to Geelong, I'll come for cents on the dollar because I yeah. just want to get out of there. And every, everyone wants to get out of the Gold Coast to live in Geelong. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a common <laughs> migration path. <laughs> Is it not? Oh, no, you're right. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> why on earth would you want to, you know, drag yourself off a, a sun-drenched beach with blue skies yeah. and a pina colada in your hand <laughs> and go to walk down Little Mallop Street, you know. <laughs> what? Oh, I, don't, I don't get it myself. Now, uh, he's got two years left on his contract. Yeah. And he's relinquished the captaincy. So there's a bit of talk about this could be a move towards uh, him potentially 
you know, trying yeah. to then make the move. I, I think Do that, you think they will move him on? Yeah, I reckon this year uh, the Gold Coast and Geelong will work towards, for most of the season, they'll be back and forth uh, until they can work out a, a way to get him back to Geelong next year. He'll play this year, but his second year of his deal, he'll be back in, in but Catalan. But the thing is, he's so injury prone yeah. now. I mean, he's a phenomenal player. There's no yeah. doubt about that. But over the last two years, he's barely played. Yeah, well, that's like, right. Would Geelong I mean, be going, oh, this is a real... I mean, unless they get him for almost nothing. If he does a, another shoulder this year... Oh, that's Geelong, it. That'll be... Geelong won't want it. But, why, but no. why, what would Geelong want to give up to get him? The only way I could see uh, the Gold Coast being home to it is either they get a... A good play, a, a good draft team. pick, probably or something, yeah. an okay draft. Well, I don't know. think Geelong have got a first rounder next year, no, so they or, can't even swap that. Or they get rid of, um, the, or Gold Coast want to offload some salary cap. Yeah, that's the only thing. But then the Cats have to take it. So is that going to? It makes not a lot of sense to me. It, it all depends on his fitness this year. Is to you know, he, he could well be finished by the end of this season, or he could have an absolute blinder, and and the, then it'll, things will get very interesting. That would be interesting. But he's, what is he now, 33 or 32? 32. 32 years old. So same age as um, Andreas Seppi, who, <laughs> <laughs> who beat Nick Kyrgios last night. Uh, well, so now all our hopes and dreams, because we should mention as well, uh, we had Sam Stoza, uh, the annual Sam so- oh, Stoza yeah. being bundled out in the first round. And, and I've got to say, we did the podcast Monday morning and then she was bundled out that afternoon. Yeah. And didn't a lot of people on Twitter want to quote us on the bundling out? I'm, <laughs> I'm almost not feeling guilty, but but I'm almost feeling sorry for Sam Stozer now because she's become a punchline. She's not. I mean, she hasn't won a, a tennis match since August last year. Yeah. I mean, n- neither of you. No, but, I'm, <laughs> I'm her and I are neck and neck. <laughs> but I'm almost feeling poor old Sam. She's just she's on an absolute hiding to nothing. But, yeah. but again, she she does herself no favours. Well, it's been a de- it's been an extraordinary decline other, in but, ability. But other than her, she won the US Open in two thousand and twelve. But other than that, you watch her play, and she continually makes unforced errors that the top elite players don't yeah. make. And yeah. she but she's always done that. And so I think she's she's sort of over delivered, if you like, on on her yeah, ability. Yeah, I think that's spot on. I which think she which did. which is better. Than under delivering like a Kyrgios. she's probably over delivered, but now she's she's having she's to put up with, to the, her with idiots ability. like us laughing every time she gets bundled out in the first round, which I got to say was pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got Tomic. Our hopes and dreams now lie with Bernard Tomic. How do you feel about that? Or Andrew Whittington from William. <laughs> I think he, he'll be he'll get flung today. But uh, yeah, as I said before. Bernie, if you're listening to this podcast, and I know you do, uh, <laughs> here's your chance to completely rehabilitate your public image at the expense of your mate Nick Kyrgios. Be a good bloke, play hard, give it your best for the next couple of rounds, and uh, people might start warming to you. <laughs> Just slightly. Well, maybe not also, but <laughs> but as you say, um, yeah, old Bernie, he's our, our one chance now. Uh, well, on that note now, Serge, wrapping this up, we've... Uh... Got, I've got the Dane Swan gig 8th of April at Yarraville. I'm yeah, going to talk, be, be interviewing Dane Swan. Now, you and I are uh, in intense negotiations, yes. like AOC delegates yeah. trying to pick venues. Uh, we're taking bribes. Uh, we're sort of looking at doing uh, shows all around the country over the national the tour yeah. of the year. So yeah. uh, we'll have we'll, news about that. So people, let us know if you want us to come visit you. We'll, We'll, we'll just, do it in your house. Yeah, we'll just do it in your backyard. <laughs> Free snag. Yeah, and a, snags and a couple of <laughs> full of crownies. You know, we'll be there. We'll just talk crap at you for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great. Uh, and on that note, uh, we'll uh, see you. We did two. We did two this week. We'll try and do two next week. And uh, what we, we are planning, in all seriousness, maybe not next Thursday, but our second one of the week, um, as the footy season gets a bit closer, we hope to have special guests every Thursday. So it's, uh, we're going right. to try and crank it up a notch a bit this year. Yeah, get a bit serious. Oh, I'd crank it up a notch. I wouldn't <laughs> say get too serious about it. But uh, Well, we'll see you next week. See you Monday. See you Monday.